at a watch. I was on the I was on Facebook all of this morning and I got a message from a lady in Africa. And she said, "Could you please send me all the messages on the series of messages on watch?" So I wrote her back and said, "Look, that series of messages will finish on November the 30th. So we haven't even um, preached them all yet. But she said, I want that series of messages. People are listening to what God is saying here to us at the Way of the Cross Baptist Church. Hebrews chapter 13, would you stand with us please as we read four verses. I speak to you this morning on the pastor's watch. Now I'm not talking about a Gucci watch. Though there are some pastors that got some of those. But uh, he's talking about his watchmanship. Look at verse number 7. I want you to pay attention because these are very specifics that God gives regarding the pastor. He says, Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow." Considering the end of their conversation. Verse 17. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves for their watch for your souls as they that must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief. For that is unprofitable for you. Verse 18. Pray for us. For we trust we have a good conscience in all things, willing to live honestly. Verse 24. Salute all them that have the rule over you, and all the saints there of Italy salute you. Look again at verse number 7. Three times you read this thought. Remember them which have the rule over you. Look at verse 17. Verse 17. Obey them that have the rule over you. I got verse number 24. Salute them that have the rule over you. Our Father. We thank you for your word. We thank you for how you have laid down your truth so that we may be the kind of people, Christian people, that honor you. And I pray, Father, that as I speak forth your word this morning, that we might take to heart the things that you say. And that day, God, as a result of your truth today, this would be one of the most loving, cooperating, Christ-honoring congregations on planet Earth. I pray that we would not be mere hearers of your word, but that we would be genuine practicers 
of the things that you say. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Thank you so much. You may be seated. I want you to ponder. Bring this down a little bit for me, please, Brother Marcus. I want you to ponder the next statement that I'm going to make. And answer it in your heart. It's the statement. Which of you would like to trade places with a pastor? You pondering that? What's your answer? Which of you would like to trade places with a pastor? It was Dr. John Phillips. who has described the job of a pastor as the highest and noblest profession on earth. Let me run that by you again. John Philip described the job of a pastor as the highest and noblest profession on earth. Why? Why would he make a statement like that about a pastor? He made that statement because of John chapter 13 and verse number 20. I want you to look at this verse, John chapter 13 and verse 20. Jesus speaking said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that receiveth whomsoever I send receiveth me. And he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. Why does he conclude that the job of a pastor is the noblest and highest job because a pastor is sent to us by the Lord. And the way that a pastor is received reflects the way that we receive the Lord. That's a big, big, serious responsibility. The Lord said, I have given to you your pastor. You are to receive your pastor as you would receive me. In other words, I have treated you with one of my gifts called a pastor. And the way that you treat the pastor is a reflection of how you think about me. Whew. Wow. That's a serious thing. You see, the pastor is an under-shepherd of the good, great, and chief shepherd. He is God's under-shepherd. God has raised up the pastor to stand in his stead before a congregation, and that congregation is known as sheep. A pastor, therefore, is a shepherd. A shepherd. In fact, in Philippians chapter number 1 and verse 1, the Bible describes the community called the church. And he says that the church is made up, Philippians chapter 1 verse 1, 
that the church is made up, guess, get this, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the what? The saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the what? With the bishops and the what? And the deacons. God says, in my church, I have on one hand, I have saints. I have on the next hand, deacons. And in the middle, I have the bishop or I have the pastor. So in this congregation right now, we've got deacons. Brother Howie, Brother Webster, deacons. The responsibility of a deacon is to help the pastor to be able to fulfill the responsibilities that are his. Spiritual responsibilities as well as other responsibilities that have to do with the care of the church. The saints are the ones that the deacons and the pastors serve. That's why he said, Paul and Timotheus, the what? Servants of Jesus Christ. So the pastor is God's servant loaned to a congregation. God's servant. He is to be a loving servant to God's people. A loving servant. In fact, the one thing that should always, always be a mark of a Christian church is that a Christian church is to be a place where love reigns. Love. In 1 John chapter number 3, listen to verse 14. 1 John chapter 3, listen to verse 14. John said, We know that we have passed from death unto life because we want love the brethren. In other words, God says, Once you say you are saved, the evidence of that is to be seen by your love. Christians, are to be the most loving people that exist in a community. Christians. Do you have any problem this morning loving anybody in this church? You have any problem loving anybody? Do you find on the inside of you some feelings towards somebody in this church that is not loving? One or two things. It's either you are genuinely saved and living a carnal life because only carnality will stop you from loving as a Christian ought to love. So it's either you are a Christian, living your Christian life according to the all you, or you are not a Christian. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. God says, if you do not love as a Christian ought to love, there is going to be a dying of the relationship between you and whoever the individual is that you are having a problem with. So for instance, if you're having a problem loving somebody, you might not want to, you might not want to talk to them. You might want to avoid them. You might not even want to look at them. You might not even want to listen to them. You might not want to pay any attention to them. All of those are indications that if you are a Christian and experiencing that, there is something wrong and carnality and that spirituality is dominating. 
And so this morning, the pastor's job is assigned to him by God. And it is assigned to him to be a watchman. Look at Hebrews chapter number 13 again. Look at verse 17. In the heart of verse number 17, God says, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves for their watch for your souls. A pastor isn't just to be nosy. A pastor's responsibility is to be like a mother to her children. He is given the responsibility to watch over the souls that God brings under his care. Let me point out something else very clearly to you while I'm on this point. There is absolutely nowhere in the Bible that a pastor is a woman. No way. The bishop is the husband of one wife. Not unless you believe in homosexuality. Can you believe then that a pastor can have, can be a female who has a partner? The Bible says that the pastor can only be a male who represents Jesus Christ. Make, let that be crystal clear because I know in this modern time, there are people who just like they want to reinvent the family. They want to reinvent the way that the church is. But God says, Obey them that have the rule over you, for they watch for your souls. The pastor is a watchman. Is a watchman. Well, let's look at several things this morning. I want us to first of all look at the responsibilities of a pastor. The responsibilities of a pastor. Listen again to verse number 7. He says, remember them which have the rule over you. The rule over you. God says that the responsibility of a pastor is to lead the congregation that God has given to him. That word rule means to lead. In 1 Peter chapter number 5, beginning at verse number 1, some very serious, serious thoughts are given to the pastor. Here's what God says. To me as a pastor, he says, The elders among you I exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness of the suffering of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Now, now look at what God says to me. Verse number two. Feed the flock which is among you, taking the what? The oversight, the oversight thereof. God says it is the responsibility of a pastor to take the oversight over the flock. There is absolutely no place in the Bible that the flock is to ever lead the pastor. Now I know in some places, you go stateside for instance, and many stateside churches, the deacons believe that they can tell the pastor how to run the church. But that is totally unscriptural. There are pastors that leave churches because the leaders of the churches want to lead the pastor. I say to you, that wouldn't happen at a way of the Cross Baptist Church. 
Not here. I don't care who you are. I don't care who you are. The reason for that is as long as Pastor Harrigan pastors the way of the Cross Baptist Church, I am going to pastor this church biblically. Biblically. You can never experience the blessings of God unless you follow the biblical instructions of God. And one of the instructions of God is that the pastor is to feed the flock. He is to take the oversight. But God says, no, be careful of how you take the oversight. He said, look at it, he says, not by constraint. In other words, look, the pastor should not be forced to do anything. But willingly. He should never do anything because anybody in the congregation says, this is the way you must do it, and if you don't do it this way, I'm not going to tithe in the church. You know that there are people in the church that do that, you know that? They hold their money in disagreement with the pastor. You're not one of those, right? That's just one illustration. He said the pastor should never be forced, you should not be compelled to do anything. But what you do, you should do it willingly. Not for filthy lucre. In other words, you don't pastor for money. You don't pastor for money. I'd say to you, perhaps the average pastor or the pastor that is really a godly man isn't in pastoring for money. You know why? Listen to me. The average pastor stateside makes over a hundred thousand dollars a year. I don't think you can find any pastor on St. Croix that makes that kind of money. Over a hundred thousand dollars a year. In fact, I was, I was looking, I was, you know, I, I, I was on the internet and it came, across, it came across these different pastors, the richest pastors. And I believe four of the top ten richest pastors in the world are black. Two of them in Africa. Two of them in America. Some making over five hundred million dollars a year. You imagine, you imagine that? A pastor? I mean, there are pastors that are making millions of dollars. But God says when it comes to pastoring my flock, it should never be for the money. And I hope there wouldn't be anyone in this congregation who would ever think or say, Pastor Harrigan, is that way the cross Baptist Church for money? I hope there wouldn't be a single one of you here. Because you know something? Pastor Harrigan can make more money other places doing other things than Pastor in the way of the cross Baptist Church. More money. But when God truly calls you to be his under-shepherd, you don't do it for money. Because you know your reward is not what people can give you, but what God has in store for you. Not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. The pastor should have the mindset of Christ, the good shepherd that giveth his life for his sheep. The good shepherd that loves his sheep. Then he goes on in verse number 3. Listen to what he says in verse number 3. He says, neither as being lords over God's heritage. In other words, the pastor must never be a dictator. Never be a dictator. You don't lord over God's hair. This is my church. Whatever I say must go. Da, 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 da. 
In fact, if ever you call here, and I've, I've corrected some of you, I've corrected some of you that at times you call and say, uh, your church, this is not my church, our church, us. The Lord's church, but ours, we're here together. They passed this church. This is God's heritage. The pastor is never to bully the church, lord over the church, be dictator over the church, but he's to be an ensample to the flock. He's to be an example to the flock. Verse number four, he goes on and says this. He says, and when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. What does he say? He said, Pastor, do know that there is a reward that you are going to get one of these days from your boss, the chief shepherd. If you, are, if you are the type of pastor that honors God, one of these days God will honor you by giving you your reward, a crown of glory. I asked you earlier if you would like to trade places with a pastor. Paul, prior to going back, said this in Acts chapter number 20, beginning at verse 28. Right into the past of the church there, he said this, taking it very seriously. He says, in Acts chapter number 20, verse 28, he says, Pastor, take heed unto yourselves. Watch for yourself first. And to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. He says, pastors, watch out for yourself. Watch out for those under your care. You are a watchman. Your responsibility is to watch for yourself as well as to watch for the scenes. That, that is so important because Jesus Christ was the watchman and a statement was made about him. Strike the shepherd and what's going to happen? The sheep will scatter. And so the, the enemy is always, always after the shepherd. Always after the pastor. The devil always wants to find something in the life of the pastor so that he can lock on on it. Because if he can lock on on it, then the pastor will not be as effective as possible. And I'm going to tell you the people that the devil uses most to lock in on the pastor are members of the congregation. Not lost people out here. Many times it's not people out in the congregation. Many times it's people in the congregation. That the devil tries to find some kink in the armor of the pastor. And some sheep locks on on that. So that that man is not able to fulfill his responsibility to the church and sometimes to that individual. You recognize that God said on three occasions that the pastor is to rule. He is to lead. And I dare say to every single one of you, the responsibility of a pastor is a heavy responsibility. Don't you ever think that the job of a pastor is a light job by any means. You talk to any godly man of God, and if he is honest with you, he will have to say the responsibility of pastoring is a heavy weight. Heavy, heavy weight. That is why those that are pastor, pastor, must do everything that you can to lighten his load and not 
make his load heavier. And we will see as we go a little further on how you, how you can do that. There are two key things about the watch of a pastor. His responsibility and his accountability. One of these days, I must give an account to God for the 32 years that he has allowed me to be pastor of this church. 32 years. I will not be able to avoid it. And God is going to lay out before me the truth about my pastoring of this church. I must give an account. And because I must give an account, I must take my responsibilities very, very seriously. Look at Titus chapter number 2 and verse 15. Paul writes into Titus, a young pastor, said this to Titus regarding his responsibility as a pastor. He says, These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. He said, Listen, you have an authority. And you are to exhort as well as rebuke. There will be times that you will have to be positive. There will be times that you will have to be negative. But he says, How, whatever you have to do, do it with authority. Don't be a pushover. Don't let people control you. Don't let people run over you. I have given you authority. Lead with my authority. And don't let anyone look down on you. That there, let no man despise you. The thought is, don't ever give anyone a cause to look down on you. You go through the Bible, you find just a number of things regarding responsibilities God has given to me. The first responsibility as a pastor is to shepherd the flock. He is to be the shepherd of the flock. Shepherd the flock. He's supposed to be a loving shepherd, a caring shepherd. A wise shepherd. That he's supposed to be a shepherd. Secondly, the pastor is not just to be the shepherd of the flock, but secondly, he's to know those that are entrusted to his care. Know those that God has given to you. Now, it used to be a time that I knew all of your telephone numbers, could just rattle them off like that. But as the church has grown, that has become more difficult for Pastor Arrogant. But it's not just know your telephone number. It's the responsibility of the pastor to, to know you not just by name. To know what's happening in your life. Not just so that he could be nosy about your business. But so that he knows how to best care for you. He's there to care for you. You ought to give him the opportunity to care for you. That's why I always, I know that there's some of you that say, Pastor, I know that you have your burdens, and so I don't want to call you, and, and, and when I'm having my burdens, that's, a, that's one of the worst kind of thinking you can ever do. For you to be going through your burdens and not let your pastor know is to rob him of a blessing. And to rob you of your blessing. He is there as God's under shepherd to help you through your times of burden. So don't any of you say, Pastor, I know you have your problems. So because you have your problems, I'm not going to put my problems upon you. 
No, 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 listen to me. You have to put your problems upon me because when you bring your problems to me, guess what I do with your problems? What does God say we do with our problems? He says, cast all your what? Cares upon him, for he cared for you. When you come to pastor with your problems, pastor's not going to take those problems upon his shoulders and worry about you day and night and lose sleep. I'm not going to do that. But I am going to go to the throne of grace and fight for you. That's the responsibility of a pastor, to know his sheep, know what's happening to them, so that he can take them to the throne of grace. Pastor's responsibility in the third place is to provide spiritual food for the flock. He says, feed the flock. Feed them. I trust that in all the years that you have been attending the way of the Cross Baptist Church, that you can honestly say, in coming to this church, Pastor Harrigan feeds us. Don't just give us pap. He gives us solid meat that I can leave here and I can honestly contend for the faith because he has us rooted and grounded in truth. He feeds the flock. See, I want these days I'm going to stand before God and I don't want any of you to be able to stand before God and say, Pastor Harrigan starved us. You ain't going to be able to say that. None of you are going to be able to say that because I take preaching with utmost, with utmost, uh, um, not only respect, but great, great concern. You know that when pastor delivers a message, it didn't just come from just a flyby. He has taken time with God and has gone into the Word and has dug into the Word. None of you can ever accuse me. I'm not studying the word and coming before you more than equip. More than equip. That's one of the reasons why sometimes the services are so long. And some of you complain. And you sit down and you look at movies. And you sit down and you do other things and you don't complain about it. But when God's precious word is being preached, you complain? How does that make God feel? Ha! Ha! I mean, we can go out to dinner and sit down and talk with a friend for two and three hours to dinner, and we can't stay one hour and hear God's word? How do you think that makes the heart of God feel? I mean, sometimes we can be on the telephone for hours. But when it comes to God's precious word, well, I mean, listen, Pastor Harrigan will never preach a sermon at in this church. I will preach a sermon. Because it's the responsibility of the pastor to feed the flock and feed spiritual food. Number four, this is the responsibility of the pastor to exhort those that are growing cold. Listen. It is very easy to come to a church regularly, sit in a congregation, and become a custom of hearing truth and allow your heart to become cold. In fact, the Bible says one of the main reasons why there is coldness in Christians is because of sin. Because iniquity hath abound, the love of many have waxed cold. So it's the responsibility of the pastor to exhort the members, do not allow yourself to become cold. It's also the responsibility of the pastor to go after the stray, to recover 
stray sheep. You know why it's important to recover straight sheep? Because when sheep stray, they have a tendency of causing other sheep to stray. Because when sheep stray, they end up in enemy's territory. Because when sheep stray, they have the potential of eating even poisonous things. When sheep stray, they can end up among sick sheep. And if they come back to the flock in this sickness, they can also cause disease in that flock. But whenever sheep strays, it is the responsibility of the pastor and the deacons in particular to go look for the stray sheep. And so, those of us that have responsibility in this church must always be looking around to see who is missing out of the congregation. Because they may be missing because of sickness or they may be missing because of straying. And if they are straying, it is the responsibility of the pastor to recover the stray sheep. There's another responsibility of a pastor to encourage the weak. And that doesn't just mean the physical weak, but it's to encourage those that are even spiritually weak. He to come alongside and strengthen them. Not only is he responsible for encouraging the weak, but he's also responsible for visiting the sick. I was telling the deacons on Thursday night in our deacons meeting, one of the things that is evident at Way of the Cross, I mean, you cannot deny it, is that we are beginning to have more and more older people that are experiencing more and more physical problems, including your pastor. Like my wife told me yesterday, you, you're not as young as you once were, you know. You better, you better realize that. The thing about it is this. If there is one thing that sick people want, is they want either a visit or at least a telephone call from the pastor and the deacons. At least a call, at least a visit. And when that doesn't happen, you can count on it. Sooner or later, you will hear about it. And is that fair? Yes. The only thing that is unfair is this. For you to be sick and keep it and not tell your pastor or deacons, how are they going to find out? I've had some people at times that have said to me, Pastor, I was sick and you didn't call me. And I said, well, how come you didn't call me and tell me you were sick? I didn't. I just don't automatically find out that you're sick. But you can count on it if Pastor Harrigan ever finds out that you are sick. You will at least get a call from Pastor praying with you. You can count on that. Pastor will visit you. He drop. His own stuff to come because it's the responsibility of a pastor to encourage the weak and to visit the sick. Let me say something else. It's also the responsibility of the saints to do the same to the pastor. Two hands to clap. I find out you are sick, I call you. You find out I am sick, what do you do? Call me. So I say, thank so many of you that called just to find out. But it's not only the responsibility of the pastor to encourage the weak and visit the sick, but it's his responsibility to urge the development of spiritual gifts. Because every time God brings 
a sheep into this flock. God brings a sheep with some spiritual gift. And that spiritual gift is to be used for the development of that congregation. So don't sit on your gift. But it's a pastor responsibility to develop. So for instance, last couple of weeks you've seen, uh, for instance, um, if you've ever been to the way of the cross, one of the things that you've seen Pastor Harrigan uh, did is uh, I, I, I look to see a, a potential within the church, see spiritual uh, gifts. For instance, we, we've watched Pastor Brannigan through the years um, just develop through this ministry. And you could just see the, the gift of, of being a, a preacher teacher, giving him opportunity to develop that gift. And uh, uh, brother, brother Gilbert, you got that opportunity a couple of weeks ago. And then this past Sunday, Brother Jamie had that opportunity. And, and through the years, Brother St. Rose has had that opportunity. And Brother Howie has had that opportunity. And that's the responsibility of the pastor. Because the pastor, uh, at times, for instance, when, when, I, when I got sick on Wednesday, bam, just like that. Didn't even, didn't even think a second. Call Brother Howie. Brother Howie, you're going to lead tonight. Call Pastor Brannigan. You're going to give the word tonight. And the thing about it, I, I, I could do that with several in this church. I, I've had to, Brother St. Royce. You got yourself in a situation like that one time, right? Sunday morning, he, I mean, he had to do it. He didn't have time to prepare. He was prepared, right? He had got to be prepared. But the... Responsibility of the pastors to develop the spiritual gifts, not only in the men, but also in the women. So, for instance, you want to see any of you ladies come up here and preach because that's not your gift. Now, the responsibility of the pastor is to give help to all to be hospitable and a godly example in their life. Let me say to you today, brothers and sisters, I could stand up here and I can preach like an angel from heaven, but if I don't live the example of a godly pastor, I am a noise. A noise. The chief responsibility of the pastor is to be a godly example to the flock. Then that flock could, could go into the community. And when the community speaks about their pastor, that they can hold their head up with, with pride. And one use pride because they realize their pastor has a very good name in the community because of his godly and good example. But more than in the community, that that is also true in the church. That the pastor is a good example to this congregation. That's why he goes over in verse number 7 again. Look at Hebrews chapter number 7. Uh, Hebrews 13. Look at verse number 7. How he specifically points this out. He says, remember them which have the rule over you. I have spoken unto the word of God. Whose faith follow. This is just like. You know, it's just like years ago, the young people were saying, I want to be like Mike. That the young people in the church says, I want to be like my pastor. I want my life to, to, to imitate Jesus like my pastor's life illust illustrates Jesus. That's a, a big responsibility, you know. It was Warren Wesby who said it this way. He said, quite frankly, it is much easier to win souls than it is to watch over souls. It's much easier to win souls than it is to watch over souls. But we cannot avoid the responsibility of watching over souls. But I want us to secondly... Look at the responsibility to the pastor. There are responsibilities of the pastor. But what are the responsibilities to the pastor? Look at verse number 7. Hebrews chapter 13, look at verse number 7. Remember them 
that have to rule over you. He said it is the responsibility of every single member to remember your pastor. Those that had to rule over you. And the thought here is, is this. You should never, ever forget a pastor that God put you under. So whether that pastor is dead or that pastor is alive, you must always remember that pastor. Pastor Rogers is dead and gone. But those of you that sat under Pastor Rogers must never, ever forget Pastor Rogers. Never. That was a godly man. Perfect? No, but a godly man. Some of you have, have moved from different places and you have moved here. But before you moved here, God had uh, you covered by a particular pastor. And you are to always remember that pastor. You know, I... I I, I, I admire Sister Ferrell. Sister Ferrell, I'll tell you something. When your pastor died, was this this year? You went back to Dominica, right? I admire that. You know what you did? You remembered your pastor. That is what God meant. Remember him. Don't forget him. Never, ever forget your pastor. Remember his preaching. Remember his teaching. Remember his praying for you and his praying with you. Remember his private counsel and example to you. Remember the pastor. That is your responsibility to the pastor. But secondly, look at verse number 17 of Acts, uh, Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13, he says, Obey them that have the rule over you. And that word obey carries a very, very strong admonition. It says, respect your pastor. Not only are you to remember him, but you are to respect the pastor. You respect him by showing your appreciation. You respect him because God has esteemed him to a position that he did not call himself to. It is a God-appointed responsibility. Respect your pastor. And one of the key ways that you show how much you respect your pastor, go back to the verse again. Go back to verse number 17. Is that it? Obey them that have the rule over you, and what? And submit yourselves. That word submit means show reverence by being submissive to your pastor. Be in submission to the pastor. Now, I know there's some people, and, and I've had it here the way of the cross. You don't have to tell, you can't tell me what to do. I've had people tell me that straight to my face at this church, you know. I've had people, I don't care if the pastor finds out. And I, tell you, I tell people, I hate to be, I would hate to be a pastor's wife. If you think it's hard being a pastor, one of the hardest things is being a pastor's wife. Because there are some people, they won't tell the pastor to his face. But they'll let the wife know so it gets to the pastor. I'm usually, I think it was, I think it was one, maybe one person say, look. Say, you know, I, I had somebody, a member of my church, to write me a letter. I knew the person wrote me this long that he said, as soon as I got a letter, I threw it in the garbage. He said, well, Pastor, that's disrespectful that you got a letter from somebody and threw it in the garbage? He said, yep, because the person didn't sign their name. So I don't know who the letter was coming from. I said, I threw it in the garbage. That's a good thing to do. Because if you, if you are bold enough to write the pastor a letter, be bold enough to sign it. 
Don't hide. Don't hide. Because to do that and not sign it is to be disrespectful to the pastor. Your responsibility is to remember the pastor. Secondly, your responsibility is to respect the pastor. Number three, your responsibility is to recognize the pastor. Recognize your pastor. Um, and sometimes you can recognize the pastor in big ways. Sometimes you can recognize the pastor in small ways. Um, for instance, I had somebody in the church last year. I think the name might have been during Pastor's Appreciation Day. Uh, uh, sometime back then, that recognized me. And, and it, wasn't, it was just a thought that, that, that means so much to me. They went out and they bought me this thing right here. This, this, this little thing right here. A family in the church. And, and it, says, it says Pastor Harrigan. <laughs> U.S. Virgin Islands. And now I dropped it. I, because it was always flashing. So I told the person, I said, you got my name in lights, man. It was always flashing. I, I dropped it and it stopped flashing. But, but it, it still says Pastor Harrigan. And, and, and as long as I live, because this, this walks by solar, I will always remember this family in this church. Gave me, just gave me this. They didn't have to do it. But what were they saying? What were they saying? I, we just want to recognize you with this little gift. In 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5, look at verses number 12 and 13. Where the Bible points out how you are to recognize the pastor. Look at this. He said, I beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. Look at the next verse. To esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. And be at peace among yourselves. He said, listen, you are to esteem your pastor very highly because of the work that he does. You know, in some churches, some members think it hard to show a pastor appreciation. Think it hard. Oh, we do so much already for the pastor. But that's not what it's about. See what it's about? To esteem them very highly in what? In love. When you recognize your pastor, you are in a very, in a very specific way saying to your pastor, I love you. And the Bible says don't just love in word only, but love in what? In deed. The sacrifices that pastors make are many times so great. In fact, you would go to almost any pastor. You will find out that the pastor has sacrificed his family so many times for the church family. Sacrifices. But there's one other thing. One other responsibility that sheep must have towards this shepherd. Not only must they remember the pastor, not only must they respect the pastor, not only must they recognize the pastor, but they must reward the pastor. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 9, beginning at verse 7. The apostle Paul speaking to the Corinthian church regarding this matter of re rewarding the pastor. Here's what he says. Look at it very carefully. He said, who goeth a warfare at any time at his own charge? 
What is he saying? He's saying, listen, when the nation calls a soldier to go to the war, the soldier does not stick his hand in his pocket and say, I'm going to pay so that I can go to war. Uh-uh. He said, who goeth to war at any time at his own charge? Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth a flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? I mean, that's ludicrous. You have a, you have a garden and you can't eat from that garden? Something is wrong? You have a flock and, and you want, and you, you want uh, some, some goat from goat water? You can't go out and kill one of your goats and have some goat water? It's, no, no, that's... And then he goes on and said in verse number 8, Verse number eight, he said, Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same? He said, listen, the law says that's the way it's supposed to be. And he goes on now in verse number nine, and he says this, he says, For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care of oxen? And what is he saying? He said, listen, in the Old Testament time, what, what they would do is they would, they would bring all of the grain in the barn, and then they would get an ox, and they would tie the ox to a rope, and the ox would, would go around, and it would keep, he would keep mashing on the, on the corn and, and, and getting the grain out of the corn. But it never had a muzzle on the ox because... As, as the ox walked, he would reach down there every now and then, got hungry, he would eat some of that corn. They never starved the, the ox. And he says, he says, it's written in the, in the law of Moses, thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen? He says, even for the animal, God saw to it that the animal would be cared for. And now he goes on in verse number 10, and he he, he Brings this out, he said, or doth he, or saith he all together for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, it is written that he that ploweth should plow in what? Hope. And he that thresheth in hope should be partakers of his hope. Verse 11, he goes on and he says this. He says, if we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? He said, listen, if the pastor preaches spiritual things, should he not be rewarded with material things? Verse 12. He goes on in verse number 12. If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. In other words, it is the responsibility of the congregation to make sure that the pastor is rewarded financially for his service. The pastor should never, ever have to come to anybody regarding his finances. Never. That congregation should say, our pastor deserves this. And without grudge or any confusion at all, reward the pastor if he is worthy of that. If he's a godly example, you ought to reward the pastor. That's your responsibility to your pastor. Whether it's Pastor Harrigan or any other pastor that pastors this church. And then he ends with one other thing. The responsibility of the pastor, responsibilities to the pastor, and thirdly, the reaction, reactions to the pastor. There are three reactions that the Bible says a pastor gets. 
Look at Hebrews chapter number 13. Look at 24. Here's the first reaction that must always come to the pastor. Salute them that have the rule over you. And that word salute is a very common word. It means greet the pastor. Members should always greet their pastor. That's what God says. God says, I am looking for that reaction from every single member. Every member should be on speaking terms with their pastor. No member should ever allow a root of bitterness to spring up in their hearts towards their pastor. In fact, in, in, in the Old Testament time, the Jews would greet with the word shalom, peace. The Greeks would greet with the word grace. Paul says, grace, mercy, and peace be unto you. I mean, uh, you should greet your pastor because of the mercy of God upon you. You should greet your pastor because uh, having your pastor to pastor you is an expression of God's mercy towards you. So number one, the first reaction is to greet the pastor. Here's the second reaction. Grieve not the pastor. Look at Hebrews chapter number 13. Look at verse number 17 again. And I don't know, you might not understand this, not being in the shoes of the pastor, but I want you to see this. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give an account. Look at the next part now. That they may do it with what? Joy. And not with what? What is he saying? Here's what he's saying. He says that every single pastor is either experiencing joy because of you as a member are experiencing grief because of you as a member. Let me tell you something. I have never known a godly pastor that has had to discipline anybody in his congregation that didn't feel like he was going to a funeral. I mean, this is one of the most awful, awful experiences as a pastor to ever go through. When you have got to discipline somebody in your congregation that you love. I mean, it's almost like, you, it's like you're going to this funeral. And the reason for that is that person is causing you grief. Do you think you are grieving your pastor in any way today? Are you grieving your pastor? The thing about it is this. To grieve your pastor in this life, and then he dies or you die, is not the end of it, you know. Because if you grieve your pastor in this life, one of these days you will stand before God and find out that it was not profitable to you to grieve the pastor. See it right there? And not with grief, for that is unprofitable to what? God said, listen, it, it is, listen you don't gain anything by grieving your pastor. You actually hurt yourself when you cause grief to your pastor. But then he says there is another one. He says one of the reactions is either joy or grief. He says make your pastor life be a life of joy. Because if it's a life of joy, it will be 
profitable to you. And so I say to each and every one, the pastor will never be perfect because you are not perfect. And because you are not perfect, the pastor will not be perfect. Just like you have feet of clay, the pastor has feet of clay. Just like the pastor make errors, you make errors. But don't hold your pastor to a higher standard of errors than you hold yourself to your standards of errors. God says, don't grieve the pastor. And then the final reaction to the pastor is found in Hebrews chapter number 13, verse 18. Go to the throne of grace on behalf of your pastor. Pray for us. If ever there is a person who needs prayer, it is the pastor. And so look, this is Sunday. You prayed for your pastor today? Last week, how many times did you pray for your pastor last week? And I'm going to tell you something. Love has everything to do with it. Your prayer life for your pastor is determined a lot by your love for the Lord and your love for your pastor. If you love somebody, you will always be there for that person. And so have you been praying for your pastor? Have you been bringing joy to your pastor? Have you been bringing grief to your pastor? I think it was either Warren Wiersbe, one of the men that I was reading after, he says, there should never be snobbishness in a congregation towards a pastor. There should never be unfriendliness. No one should ever just pass the pastor by. No one should ever not greet the pastor. And I, I had a smile because one of the first people that walked into this church this morning was a little fellow. A little fellow. Knowing the message, I had a smile because as soon as he came to the door, he said, good morning, pastor. And Sister Lorraine's little son. I mean, I, I just had to. I mean, I had a, it tickled me. It tickled me after hearing what God said, that one of the reactions to your pastor is to always greet him. The minute he walked through that door and he saw me, he said, good morning, pastor. And I thought... That's exactly. And, and little children. You know, sometimes children do that and many times as adults. And so today, you've heard a message from a pastor about a pastor. And sometimes it is easier for another pastor to preach a message like what I just preached to you. One of the things that the Bible always says about the pastor, he is to preach the word. Don't avoid anything. Even when it has to do with you, don't avoid the matter. So I am waiting my day at the judgment seat of Christ. I can't avoid it. And I want to make sure that when I stand before the Lord, that even in all of my perfections, 
my conscience, my conscience will be crystal clear. That by the help of God, I did everything that I could to be a godly example. Did not take advantage of you. Did not fleece you. But set the example that you could follow.